Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Sexuality. As you know, this week in class, we're looking at the making of the modern sexual binary in American culture. Why is it that today we tend to think that people are either heterosexual or homosexual? Where did these categories come from, and how did they come to dominate our thinking about sexuality? According to lots of scholars, the homo-hetero binary was something created by turn-of-the-century sexologists, who came to conceive of sexuality more in terms of object choice than in terms of gender performance. Yet, not everyone attributes this shift to the work of doctors and psychiatrists. In her award-winning book, The Straight State, historian Margot Kennedy contends that the homo-hetero divide was largely a product of state policies, and in particular, policies around citizenship. Having talked a little bit about the idea of sexual citizenship, we're now ready to explore Kennedy's argument. As I mentioned last time, Kennedy identifies the 1940s, in other words, the World War II years, as the moment when the U.S. government began to inscribe a homosexual-heterosexual divide into citizenship policy. We'll have an opportunity to talk about this in a couple of days when we get to reading Kennedy's article on the GI Bill. For now, however, I wanted to set this up for you by talking about the pre-World War II era, uh, that is the period just before the American federal government bureaucratized the sexual binary. What were things like before the homo-hetero divide came into existence? What was the government's regulation of sexuality like during the first few decades of the 20th century? In particular, how did the state deal with members of the general public who exhibited the kinds of traits and behaviors that would later be labeled homosexual. According to Kennedy, although homosexuality was not a new phenomenon for federal officials in the 1940s, up until then, they were relatively unconcerned with this. Homosexuals were variously referred to as perverts, degenerates, pederasts, and sodomites. But when policing them, the U.S. often did so under the rubric of some other concern, like, for example, poverty, disorder, violence, or crime. Before the 1940s, there was no clear axis that separated the population into homosexuals and heterosexuals. So in order to see how different things were before World War II, I want us to begin with an exploration of U.S. immigration policy in the late 19th and early 20th century. It was during this period that the U.S. became a gatekeeping nation, as Congress passed numerous laws, including the Page Law of 1875 and the Chinese Exclusion Act of 1882, that prevented entire nationalities of people from entering the country. Other laws prohibited certain kinds of individuals, like those suffering from various infectious diseases, from entering the country. In order to police the country's borders, in 1891, the Bureau of Immigration was created, and among other things, its agents conducted screenings of prospective immigrants at all major points of entry, including Ellis Island in New York and Angel Island in California. Interestingly, among the various things immigration inspectors were asked to look for when examining potential migrants were, quote, oddity of dress and, quote, unusual decoration worn on the clothing. Going beyond this, in the United States Public Health Service's Manual for the Mental Examination of Aliens, inspectors were urged to watch for, quote, striking peculiarities in dress, talkativeness, witticism, facetiousness, flightiness, unnatural actions, mannerisms, and other eccentricities. The manual also informed inspectors that, quote, if the characteristics of one sex approach those of the other, it might signify 
degeneration. As this suggests, gender nonconformity and sexual perversion were among those things that the U.S. government was interested in detecting among potential immigrants. Most agents associated these things with quote-unquote primitive races and the lower classes, meaning that poor immigrants and non-whites were the most likely targets for investigation. As a public health service report from 1901, speaking of Italian men, noted, it was relatively common to meet with individuals from this ethnic group who had, quote, a beardless face, the high-pitched feminine voice, and the general carriage of an old woman with abdomen and pelvis of the female type. Fairly regularly, prospective immigrants who displayed, quote, lack of sexual development or, quote, arrested sexual development were held back by officials who often believed that this would make them economically dependent on the government. As one official noted, these individuals were, quote, bad economic risks because, quote, their abnormality soon becomes known to their associates who make them the butt of coarse jokes to their own despair and to the impairment of the work at hand. Clearly, this policy worked to keep certain homosexuals out of the U.S. However, the fusion of ideas about sexual morality and gainful employment meant that the law was somewhat limited. What was the government to do in cases where sexual deviance was not correlated with economic dependence? There were, in fact, several cases where wealthy individuals successfully challenged the government's attempts to keep them out or deport them. As this makes clear, there was no specific law preventing the immigration of homosexuals into the country. Financially well-off homosexuals often had no trouble entering the U.S. The homosexual, as cut off from a non-white or a poor background, had yet to appear to immigration officials. There were similar ambiguities within the U.S. military. It was during the First World War that Army and Navy commanders first became aware of the existence of what they called sexual perversion among sailors and soldiers. Working with the Bureau of Immigration, they began to develop methods of mass screening and examination to identify so-called perverts in the ranks. One manual, for example, warned that, quote, the degenerate male physique as a whole is often marked by diminished stature and inferior vigor. Official regulations advised inspectors to watch for recruits who, quote, present the general body of the opposite sex with sloping narrow shoulders, broad hips, excessive pectoral and pubic adipose deposits, with lack of masculine hair and muscular markings. Despite issuing standards like these, the military was not strict in adhering to them. Many with anatomical quote-unquote defects were drafted, in part because military psychiatrists lacked the resources to totally screen out homosexuals, and in part because some of the military's top officials were skeptical of the idea that homosexuality equated with low intelligence or physical weakness. Typically, the only gay soldiers rejected or discharged were those who engaged in homosexual acts. And even here, things like court-martials only happened in cases of sexual violence, like rape. Consensual and private encounters rarely met with much scrutiny. As long as they were discreet, men who engaged in homosexual relationships could continue to serve in the military. On the basis of this, we can conclude that the various branches of the armed services hadn't yet come around to the view that queer men didn't belong in the military. This policy would not shift until World War II. It was during the Great Depression that we first see the signs of a new direction in U.S. federal policy. In response to the massive economic fallout of the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt spearheaded a series of relief programs through Congress that collectively came to be known as the New Deal. A key goal of these programs was to provide financial support to the millions of American men who lost their jobs and were forced to move away from their hometowns in search of work. In 
One specific effort to help these men was the Federal Transient Program, or FTP, which created hundreds of migrant camps all across the country to give food, shelter, and work to uprooted men. The FTP was created in 1933, and from the very beginning, it was viewed with suspicion. It quickly became one of the most unpopular New Deal programs and was ultimately terminated in 1935, only two years after its creation. Why was this? What made the FTP so unpopular? From the very beginning, the program was viewed with suspicion. It was accused of fostering sexual perversion among unemployed transients. In large part, this owed to a general belief that homosexuals preferred vagrancy to the settled life. Indeed, there was a widespread assumption in 1930s American culture that homosexual behavior ran rampant among transients. As Dr. Samuel Kahn wrote in his 1937 book, Mentality and Homosexuality, quote, most fags are floaters and move from town to town. During the Great Depression, approximately 400,000 young American men became migrants. And from memoirs of the 1930s, we know that young transients sometimes engaged in homosexual behavior as a kind of coping strategy, as a way to earn a few dollars and obtain some shelter as they moved from place to place. New Deal officials knew about this. For example, in 1932, a report from the U.S. Children's Bureau detailed the risks facing the transient boy, which included, quote, degenerates and perverts who were eager to initiate new boys into evil habits and teach them how to pick up a few odd dollars in any big city. FTP officials themselves were worried that transient youths might become, quote, the prey of degenerates, as one popular journal put it. That was in part why the, exist, why the agency existed in the first place, to prevent this. But the FTP struggled to achieve its goals. Inadequate screening systems at the camps meant that older men and young males were often thrown together, and the newspapers and magazines produced by camp residents indicate that homosexual relationships were quite common here. Gender inversion was a regular source of humor in these publications. One included an article asking, Professor, what's the Latin for pansy? Another showed a cartoon in which an effete gentleman had to decide between the men's or the women's restroom with a caption that read, She tosses a coin to decide. In another cartoon called Camp Foster Pajamas, which you can see on the screen here, a man's naked rear was exposed to viewers under the caption, Good night, fellows. The directors of these camps sometimes wrote in to the federal government asking questions like, what advice can you give us to the handling of homosexuals? Unable to provide a concrete answer, the FTP was ultimately killed by accusations that instead of helping men to desire women, home, and family life, it might be helping them to adjust to a quote-unquote abnormal life, that is, the life of the homosexual hobo. Thus, the program ended in 1935. To be clear, homosexuals were not excluded from the camps, and many benefited from the FTP's largesse. But in the coming years, this would no longer be the case. By World War II, the government would pursue more explicit prohibitions against homosexuality. Okay, so that gets us through the World War II years, or up to them, uh, which we'll discuss next time. As we read through Kennedy's article on the GI Bill, let's keep these general questions in mind. After you've read Kennedy's article and had some time to think about these questions, please head over to our discussion board and share your thoughts. I look forward to seeing you all over there in our virtual classroom. Until then, take care and bye-bye.